Hey everyone, Road Breach here, and today we're taking a look at Resident Evil Village. Resident Evil Village is an action horror game developed and published by Capcom for PC, Xbox One, Xbox Series S and X, PS4, and PS5 on May 7th, 2021. I've always thought Resident Evil was a cool series with really cool concepts and characters, Leon especially. I've been expecting you, my brethren. No thanks, bro. I may get to the other games at some point, and I probably should have started with Resident Evil 1. Why did I pick this game to review for this month? Because this game has DLC that you haven't played until this video. Yeah, good point, Castle. One thing I will have to mention before we continue is that this game does have PlayStation VR 2 support, but since I don't have it, I won't be able to comment on how good that feature is. But seeing as how I loved Resident Evil 4 on the Quest 2, I'm willing to bet it's really good. Grab some herbs and some ammo, and let's see what this game has to offer. The game's graphics are fantastic. The game goes for a photorealistic aesthetic, and it works damn near perfectly. The village is trashed and disheveled, making you wonder what went down before you got here. But it's not just the village that feels well-crafted, because the Lord's domains look different and distinguishable from one another. Castle Dimitrescu is regal and fancy-looking. Moreau's Reservoir is gross in some areas and has buildings around water. Heisenberg's factory is industrial and rusty. And Donna's house is, well a house, but it feels distinct from the other locations. And that's before you get into the character designs. The lords in particular are also very well designed, and you can glean what they're like just by how they look. The only one I have any complaints about is Donna. She does talk through the doll, but I feel like she looks a little too plain for my taste. Besides Donna, all the lords have mutated forms. My favorite definitely has to be Heisenberg's, with how it's mostly mechanical with organic bits poking through. He kind of looks like a Transformer from the Michael Bay movies, and it wasn't until I looked at his model in the model viewer when I was able to see that he has some wheels from cars, trucks, and a motorcycle to move around. Around. One thing that Resident Evil does often is change what the core enemies are. In Resident Evil 4, they were the Granados, in 7, they were mold creatures, and here they're lichens. Feral wolfmen that will consume if you're not careful. But they are not the only enemies you'll run into, as there are biomechanical soldats, flying samkas, and a few others. They're obviously not as distinct as the Lords, but I definitely won't be confused as to what game they belong to. But that's not to say the visuals aren't without some rough spots, because some textures are low resolution, and there are a few visual oddities that are few and far between, but I'm still going to point them out. There's a point when Ethan's hand gets cut off, his jacket looks like it's made of rubber because of the thickness, and the chain links in this mill are obviously 2D sprites, and they just refuse to show Ethan's face. Seriously, why do they adamantly refuse to show his face? What were they even trying to go for by hiding his face? What effect is achieved by hiding it? I believe that if a character is going to appear on screen, do not hide their face unless it's for a good reason. Because here, it's not a mystery, it ruins the cinematic effect they were going for, and Ethan is an important character in the story. Sorry about the rant, I just hate this aspect of the game. Besides all that, the voice acting is great, though Moreau was very hard to understand without subtitles. The sound design is pretty good, and it further adds to the immersion with the sounds of wind and other background noises. There is music here and there, and I feel indifferent about the music. It works to build to the effect of the situation you're in, but I don't really have anything substantive to say about it. So the presentation is pretty good for the most part. So let's talk about the gameplay. Resident Evil Village is a survival horror game with combat. You're given several guns through the course of the game, and every so often, you run into enemies. Typically, Resident Evil games have limited ammo that you need to make count every time you're in combat, and limited healing items that you need to make sure you use sparingly. But ammo and healing items aren't as scarce here, especially since you can craft ammo and medicine with resources you can find around the levels. Weapons have different strengths and weaknesses like pistols not being that powerful, but having ammo that you can find really often. Shotguns are powerful, but ammo for them is scarce. The grenade launcher is even more powerful, but it has radial damage and can only hold one round at a time. You also have pipe bombs and landmines that do radial damage. The enemies will also often step on landmines when you use them. You're a poopy head. When we spell it out, you're a poopy head. You also have a knife, which is a weapon that you start with. It's dicey to use in combat, but it can come in handy in situations where you run out of ammo. You can also block attacks, but it only lessens the damage you take. It does help, and I find it funny how effective it can be against certain attacks. And since I'm playing on PS5, you can enable gyro aiming to make combat easier. 
mouse and keyboard. Why don't you go build a bridge and jump off it? But combat isn't the only thing you do here because you have puzzles to solve. Puzzles often require items that you usually find elsewhere from where the puzzle is. But there are some puzzles that don't need an item to be solved, like the bridge puzzle at the reservoir or the bell puzzle at Castle de Matresque. And as you explore, you'll open locked doors which allow you to navigate easier through the level. One thing that helps you figure out whether or not you're done is the map. The map will have areas highlighted in blue or red. Red meaning that there are still things to find in the room, and blue blue meaning that there's nothing else to find in this room. Admittedly, I did get lost quite a bit, but luckily the map is just one button away, so I wasn't lost for too long. The original three Resident Evil games were saved by finding an ink ribbon and going to a typewriter, but here the game does autosave in some instances, but I normally saved the game whenever I made substantial progress just to be safe. And much like in Resident Evil 4, this game has a merchant who you can buy stuff from, upgrade your weapons, and sell stuff in exchange for money. You can also buy guns gun parts that unlock further upgrade tiers. You can also shoot animals to get their meat and bring them back to the duke, and he'll make you dishes that give you boosts like speed boosts, less damage taken when guarding, and so on, which is a feature that I kind of forgot about, but I did use this when I first played this game on Xbox One. There are also documents you can find throughout the level that give you some background information on the characters. All of these documents you can reread at any time anywhere around the game by opening the journal. There are more mechanics I could talk about, but let's talk about the story for now. The game opens with a story about a mother and daughter going berry picking, but the little girl wanders off and gets lost. She runs into several creatures who give her gifts like hydration, food, and clothing. But when she comes across a mechanical horse and takes his gear, the horse doesn't like this and summons the other creatures who evaporate into a witch. But before we can see more of the story, we get to see that the story is actually a fairy tale being read by Mia Winters, Ethan's wife from Resident Evil 7, to their daughter Rose. Ethan asks why she's reading a story like this to Rose, and Mia says the woman at the store she bought it from said it was a local tale. Ethan reminds Mia that they moved away from Louisiana to forget about what happened in Resident Evil 7, but Mia tells him that he's just being paranoid and to go put Rose to bed. Bed. Ethan goes downstairs and we see that Mia made a stew for dinner, and Mia tells Ethan that he shouldn't worry about the stuff that happened in Louisiana, but the conversation gets cut short because Mia gets shot and Chris walks in and makes sure Mia is dead. What the hell, Chris? Is this because I didn't pick you first in Resident Evil 1? One of Chris's squad members gives Rose to him, and Ethan tells him to get his hands off his daughter and he gets knocked out and Chris tells his men to get him out of here. Ethan flashes back to an argument he had with Mia after getting off the phone with the doctor about Rose's test results of some sort. We may need to put a pin in this one for later. Ethan wakes up in a crash, and he makes his way through the snow to a village and runs into an old man who's very frazzled, and he asks Ethan if somebody sent him. But before Ethan can fully explain himself, the old man tells him to be quiet because there's something very dangerous nearby. The old man gives Ethan a gun, and the old man tries fending off the monsters, but ultimately gets killed by one of the monsters. Ethan gets pulled through the floorboards, and he sees several people have been killed here. Ethan gets accosted by one of the lichens that bites off his fingers, and he takes takes aim and kills it. Ethan gets outnumbered, but just as he's about to be torn apart, a bell sounds off and the lichens go towards it and leave Ethan alone to bandage up his hand. Ethan finds an old woman, and Ethan tells her that it's not safe out here, and the old woman recognizes that he's Rose's father. Ethan asks where she is, and the old woman tells Ethan that Rose is in great danger, and the village has fallen into darkness ever since Rose was brought here. The old woman closes the gate while giving Ethan an ominous warning that they're coming. Let them come. Earlier, Ethan found a radio with some woman telling survivors to come to Louisa's house near the field. Unfortunately, the gate is locked, but Ethan finds some survivors and tells them to hang tight while he finds a way to open the gate. I'm not sure if you have to kill the lichens before you open the gate, but I did it anyway because the combat is pretty fun. I also needed to look up how to get over the gate the first time I played this on Xbox One. You need to go through the window of the survivor's house, climb over here, and you're past the gate. Ethan gets the gate open for the survivors, and Ethan asks the lady what's going on, and she says that Mother Miranda always protected them, and that it doesn't make sense why any of this is happening. Ethan tries to get somebody to answer, but nobody answers the door. So the lady tries to get somebody to answer, and a guy with a shotgun named Yulian answers the door, and the lady tells him that he doesn't need to worry, but Yulian turns his gun on Ethan. 
Elena's father, that's the lady's name by the way, collapses in front of the door because of his injuries, and Elena begs Julian to let them in. But he doesn't want to because the lichens will smell the blood and endanger them all. Louisa comes to the door and asks what's going on, and Julian says they want to let a dying man into their home. But Louisa says that they are their friends and lets them in. But she notices that Ethan isn't local, and Ethan introduces himself. Louisa believes that if Elena trusts him, then she has no reason not to trust Ethan, and lets him in while sending Julian to go check the grounds. I don't doubt that he's probably more capable than that other guy Ethan ran into, but you're still sending him into a no man's land. Ethan gets brought deeper into the house, where we see all the survivors. A guy named Anton isn't too happy that Louisa brought an outsider into her house, and things aren't made better when Ethan asks if this is all that's left of their whole village. Anton rants about the monsters that took the lives of their friends around the village, but Louisa cuts his rant short when she says that's enough. Ethan asks what's going on, and Louisa tells him that they don't know. One minute they were a devout village, and the next they got attacked by monsters. Elena asks where Yulian is, and Louisa tells her that she sent him out to get some help. Roxana suggests that they pray for him, and they all gather around the table and hold hands with Ethan and deliver a prayer for their safety. Unfortunately, the prayer was in vain because Elena's father succumbs to the lichen virus and starts attacking everyone in the room. So Ethan and Elena escape. There's a truck in the garage that they can use to bust through the wall and get to the attic. Elena asks what they're going to do when they escape and Ethan says that he's going to get her to a safe house and find his daughter. Elena's father manages to get to the attic, and he says Elena's name, which gives her hope that he can be saved, but the boards break, and Elena gets trapped. Ethan tries to get her to escape with him, but she tells him to go save his daughter. Ethan tries one more time to save her, but she falls into the fire, and Ethan gets mad because he feels like everyone is dying on him. Ethan makes it outside, and he sees that Yulian is begging for his life as Mother Miranda takes it from him, and she vanishes. Ethan goes to that castle because he believes that's where Rose is being held. He runs into Carl Heisenberg, and he's impressed with how well Ethan survived the onslaught of lichens. And when Ethan asks who he is, he realizes that he's not local and restrains him and takes him to Mother Miranda. Ethan wakes up in front of the Lords and Mother Miranda, and they're discussing what to do with Ethan. Miranda decides to put Ethan's fate in Carl's hands, but Alcina gets indignant about her decision, arguing that he's immature and has questionable devotion to Miranda. Not gonna lie, I love watching this argument, and Ethan asking if he gets a say in this is just golden. Miranda asserts that her decision is final, and Carl tells Ethan to get ready, as he has Ethan running through an obstacle course. Some standouts of this obstacle course would definitely be the room with the spiked ceiling that you need to escape from, and this end room where you need to take refuge in this little divot, so you don't get shredded. Ethan escapes and heads to the entrance of Castle Dimitrescu, where he meets the Duke. Ethan asks how he knows his name, and he says this, Anyone who is anyone has heard of the likes of you. Which tells me absolutely nothing. Ethan enters the castle to search for his daughter, but he gets greeted by Alcina's daughters, Bella, Cassandra, and Delenia, who bring him to Alcina. Alcina is impressed that he was able to escape Carl's obstacle course, and decides to try some of his blood and remarks about how he's going stale. One of the daughters says they should devour him quickly, but Alcina says they should inform Miranda about Ethan's whereabouts before they do that, and they hang him up by his hands, and they leave. I find it funny that Bandai tried to copy Resident Evil with Countdown Vampires in 1999, and Capcom decided to use vampires in Resident Evil 22 years later. You have to fight the three daughters by exposing them to light and shoot them while avoiding their sickles. Cassandra's fight is different from Bella's fight, in that you have to move a bookshelf and blow open a hole in the wall to get the cold air to flow in. And Daniela's fight has you flipping a lever to open the ceiling to let the cold air in. If I got the names of these women wrong, I don't fucking care, because it shouldn't have been this hard to figure out who the fuck these women are! There's also a sniper rifle that you can find in this castle, and this thing is very powerful, though it does have a slow fire rate by nature of being a sniper rifle. How much blood and sweat do you think it took to raise those daughters? I could help you make more. There's a document that mentions a dagger that can be used against Alcina, and Ethan finds it and uses it against her. She transforms into a monster, and we fight Alcina in a boss fight. You need to shoot Alcina in her upper body or head while avoiding her bite. She'll crash into one of the towers of the castle, and you need to keep shooting at her. After Ethan defeats Alcina, he finds a container of some sort, and the pressure plate it's sitting on opens a door, and Ethan exits the castle. Unfortunately, Rose wasn't here, so we need to look elsewhere for her. Ethan runs into that old woman again, and demands to know what's going on and where Rose is. 
and she says that Rose will be sacrificed and gives him a riddle about four crests opening the path he seeks. Ethan meets up with the Duke, and he says that his excursion was all for nothing, but the Duke asks him if he's so sure that's the case, and Ethan shows him the container he just got from the castle. The Duke tells Ethan to take a closer look at the container, and he sees that it has Rose's name on it, meaning something was done to her to put her head in this container. But luckily, Rose can be saved. The Duke explains that the four lords serve under Miranda, and the ones that are still alive have the other flasks. Donna Benevento, who lives in the valley, Salvatore Moreau, who lives in the reservoir, and Carl Heisenberg, who lives in the factory on the village outskirts. The doors to these different domains are locked, and need a key, which can be modified with different parts that match the door. So the next lord we need to visit is Donna. You go down into the basement, and just before you grab the next container, the lights go out, and the container disappears when the lights come back on. And all your guns are gone too. Down here, there's a life cycle doll of Mia that you need to gradually disassemble to solve the puzzles down here. There's a breaker box that you need to find a fuse for, but you need to open it with a key that you find in the well beneath the house. But then, the scariest moment in this whole game happens. As you're making your way back to the breaker box, you get stopped by this fetus looking thing, and you need to run and hide from it, go to the breaker box to use the key on it, use the relief of the child to open this door, grab the fuse from the bedroom, and hide again when you find the fetus is blocking your path again. This sequence scared the hell out of me the first time I played it, and it still is pretty suspenseful, especially since you have no weapons. Once you get back to the ground floor, you get to the living room, Donna appears, and she says she's not going to let you leave and you gotta find the doll Angie and stab her three times before the other dolls murder Ethan. The final time she gets stabbed, it turns out you actually stabbed Donna, and the container he was looking for raises up on a pillar next to the door. The next container is at the reservoir, and Ethan takes it very easily, but Moreau begs Ethan not to take it because the others will laugh at him for his incompetence if he does. But it was a ruse to trap Ethan with this strange goo of his. You need to shoot the goo to get rid of it, and the path to the reservoir is even blocked off by this stuff. On the way to escape the reservoir, you get to drive a boat. You hold the left stick forward to accelerate, and you move it left or right to steer. And anytime you stop moving, the boat does drift a small bit to make it feel like you're actually on water. Ethan comes to some sort of research post, and he gets jumped by one of Chris's men, and Chris says he's impressed with how he's made it this far, and it would be a shame if something happened to him right now. And Ethan ridicules him and tells him to finish the job for killing Mia. One of Chris's men says he's getting motion readings, and that Miranda possibly knows they're here. Ethan asks how he's involved, and Chris tells him it's none of his business, but he gets attacked by a giant fish, and Ethan scrambles to get himself onto the pier. Moreau also climbs onto the pier, and Ethan tells him to stay back. Moreau tells Ethan that the exit is underwater, and that he's too late, because Miranda is already preparing for the ceremony. Ethan thinks it's pathetic that Miranda sent him, of all people, to slow him down, but Moreau falls into the water and transforms into a giant fish so you need to book it to dry land. Ethan needs to drain the water, but there's no power at the gatehouse, so you need to make a path across the reservoir to get the crank and zip line back to the other windmill to use the crank to align the windmill so it can generate power for the gatehouse to open the floodgate and drain the water. I'm starting to get security breach flashbacks, but before Ethan can leave, we need to fight Moreau. He'll spew acid at you that you need to avoid. It's best to shoot him when his upper body is exposed. He'll also climb onto one of these houses and make acid rain that you need to take cover from, and he'll make walls of goo that you need to destroy. The arena also has explosive barrels that you can use to damage him. After Moreau is defeated, Ethan gets a part of the key from Moreau's little hideout, and he gets contacted by Heisenberg. He expresses how he's impressed with Ethan's determination and offers him a hand by directing him to a stronghold to get the last container. The stronghold is basically an endurance round. Lycans will pour in, and you need to fight them off with everything you got. Luckily, this stronghold has plenty of supplies to help you in battle. You also fight a Urius with a hammer. He'll slam his hammer down and throw columns at you, and he'll do a spin attack. Some Lycans will also spawn in to make the fight harder. After you defeat the Urius, Ethan finds the last container, and Carl congratulates Ethan for getting past the enemies. Ethan tells him to stop hiding, but Heisenberg tells him to calm down, and he tells him to get to the factory to talk to him. Ethan puts all four containers in the altar, which somehow allows you to take this big, heavy stone altar all the way to the ceremonial site, which erects a bridge to get to the factory. Ethan gets to the factory, and he uncovers a collage of pictures that has Mia and Rose. Heisenberg shows up, and he tells Ethan to sit down, and tells him that he's being played, and that all of this is a test to see if Ethan's strong enough to join Miranda's family. Heisenberg tells him that his daughter is special, and gives him an ultimatum. 
join him, and they can use Rose to kill Miranda. But Ethan declines and tells him that his daughter isn't a weapon. Heisenberg gives Ethan one last chance to join him, but Ethan declines, and he gets chased by a strum, and escapes it by jumping down the trash chute. This scene with Heisenberg and Ethan is genuinely great, and it also makes me wonder what Carl would have done afterwards if Ethan joined him. Besides that, Ethan now needs to escape the factory. The factory has you looking for impression molds to take to the foundry to cast items to use for the puzzles. This place also has soldats that need to be taken out by shooting them in the glowing spot. There's also a point in the factory where you need to fight a strum. The strum will charge at you and destroy the walls that gives you more room to move around and shoot it in the back. The strum will also shoot fire, which you need to avoid. It's also here where I finally understood the significance of the story that Mia read to Rose in the beginning. Heisenberg's key has a horse head on it, much like the Iron Steed from the story, and all the monsters from the book are supposed to represent the lords. The Bat is Alcina, the Weaver is Donna, the Fish King is Salvatore, we've already established that the Iron Steed is Heisenberg, and the Witch is Miranda. Not only that, but you deal with them in the same order as they appear in the book. So that's why I believe the storybook from the opening cutscene is representative of the story in the game. Ethan gets to the ground floor of the factory, but he can't get out. Heisenberg comes to congratulate Ethan, and he tells him to stay out of his way as he mutates into that awesome form that I praised earlier. He kind of reminds me of that thing from Revenge of the Fallen. No, I am not calling that thing Devastator. He also doesn't have those stupid fucking wrecking ball testicles they added for no fucking reason whatsoever. Heisenberg knocks Ethan into the waste runoff, and he runs into Chris, who chastises Ethan for not backing down, and Ethan brings up that he killed Mia. But Chris tells him that it was Miranda impersonating Mia, and that she survived being shot. Ethan calls bullshit and asks why he didn't tell him earlier, and Chris tells him that this job is hard enough without civilians getting in the way. Ethan asks why them, and Chris finally agrees to explain everything to him. Miranda's a mad scientist, and all of the monsters in this village are her life's work, and she was experimenting with the mold from Louisiana. Chris then shows Ethan some pictures his comrade sent him of Miranda at the altar. Ethan sees the picture of the containers with his daughter in them, and he freaks out and says they gotta go. Chris tells him to relax because his men are monitoring the situation, but Ethan doesn't care because she still has his daughter. Chris tells him that he doesn't stand a chance against Miranda, but Ethan swears to make Miranda a dead woman, and Chris allows him to take the tank he was building. Holy shit, I get to use this thing? This is officially the best Resident Evil game Capcom has ever made. Ethan takes the tank topside, and we have a fight with Heisenberg. Carl will swing his saw blade at you, and you can block it by hitting the guard button. The tank has a machine gun and a mortar that both have infinite ammo, but you need to let the mortar reload for a few seconds after every shot. You have to shoot Carl in his glowing spots, but he'll also put up a shield that has a spot you can shoot through. <laughs> you bet your skid plate I am. Heisenberg eventually grabs you and holds you in the air, and you have to shoot him in the face, and he drops you. Unfortunately, you can't use the tank anymore. It was fun while it lasted. Carl tries to slice Ethan from the family jewels up, but the factory explodes, and Carl says this. The That's a reference to Resident Evil 5, and I love that line because it sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> So now that the tank is out of the equation, you have to keep shooting Heisenberg in the face and block his attacks, which I find pretty damn funny considering how ineffective it would be to block something like this by simply raising your arms. Carl uses his powers to make you ASCEND and tries to grind you up, but Ethan shoots one last mortar at him and he explodes. Ethan gets a call from Chris and he asks what happened, and Ethan tells him that he dealt with Heisenberg and that he's gonna find Miranda and get Rose back, but Chris tells him that it's too dangerous to do it alone and that he should wait for him. Him. But then Ethan hears a baby that he's unsure if it's Rose. Then Mia appears, but she makes it clear that she's not actually Mia, and decides to stop the charade and turns back into Miranda. Miranda then reminds Ethan of Evelyn's power over the mold, and that Rose is Evelyn's successor, and that she'll grow to completely control the mold. And it turns out Heisenberg was right, and that all of this was a test, and Ethan's worth as a lab rat has run out, and she rips his heart out, and declares that she will see her true child at the ceremony. Chris gets contacted by one of his men, and he confirms that Ethan died. But regardless of the circumstances, they plan on killing Miranda and rescuing Rose. But the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance also show up, and they are not doing anything to help. You now play as Chris, and you just have to mow down lichens with a machine gun while proceeding to the objective. Chris also has a silenced pistol, grenades, and going into dark areas activates a tactical visor. 
Fighting as Ethan was alright, but just being able to go ham on the trigger with lots of ammo is such a freeing feeling. Once you get to the objective, you need to mark the target, which allows Lobo to send a mortar at the Mega My Seat. But one mortar isn't enough, so you need to wait for Lobo to reload while you fight off more Lycans. Do that two more times, and you now have a way to the Mega My Seat. But there's a giant Urius with a mace guarding the Mega My Seat so you need to fight it. The Urius will lunge at you with the mace. You can shoot it in the back, but you need to use the target marker to bring him down. Chris plants the explosive, but he can't detonate it yet because the explosive is powerful enough to destroy the whole village. Chris finds Miranda's lab and Mia locked in a cell. Chris contacts his men to make sure that it's really her, and he's told Miranda is still at the ceremony site, so this really is Mia. Chris asks why Mia's here, and she tells him that she was caught and used in experiments. Chris is asked by one of his squad mates if Chris actually found Mia, and he confirms that he really found her. He asks what's going on topside, and they say that it's nothing they can't handle, and Chris tells them to stick to the mission as he heads to the ceremony site. Mia demands to know where Ethan and Rose are, and he tells her that Ethan is dead, but Mia tells him that Ethan has more to him than meets the eye. Ethan finds himself in some sort of afterlife, and he meets Evelyn, who tells him that he's dead, and it's revealed that he was actually murdered three years ago by Jack Baker, and that his consciousness was infused with the mold. Oh, so that's how Ethan survived all those falls. Maybe Cassie is secretly a mold creature too. Evelyn tells him that he can't ever see his family again, but Ethan knows that his mission to save Rose isn't over, and he wakes up in the Duke's carriage. They arrive at the altar site, and this is your last chance to stock up on supplies before the final battle. Ethan goes to the ceremony site, where Miranda brings Rose out of the altar, and Ethan confronts her and demands her to give him back his daughter. She gets shot, and Ethan grabs Rose, but Miranda grabs her, declares Ethan won't take this moment away from her, and transforms for the final boss fight. Miranda will advance towards you and slash at you, which is when you need to block. She'll then grow spider legs and try to stab you with them. She'll then grow wings and dive bomb you, then create energy balls that you need to block or shoot at. She'll then make the site go dark, and you need to find her before she finds you. What do you do to kill her? Unload every last bullet into her that you can. Miranda dies, leaving behind Rose, and Ethan comforts her as his body decays. Chris comes along to get Ethan out of the village, but Ethan feels that he needs to be taken with the village, and tells Chris to teach Rose to be strong. Chris gets to the chopper, and gives Rose to Mia as the village blows up behind them. Ethan made the ultimate sacrifice, and died a hero to protect his daughter. The story from the beginning is then retold in the form of a song, and when it gets to the point of the story that was cut off, we see a father who, much like Ethan, sacrifices himself to protect his daughter. We cut to Rose as a teenager on a bus with the book she had as a kid. She gets off the bus and brings some flowers to her father's grave, but her visit is cut short when a BSAA agent arrives to collect Rose, and we close off with the father's story is now done. After you beat the game, you unlock some bonuses that you can purchase with completion points or... Yeah, I don't think I want them anymore, but that's not all there is, because you also have DLC that adds a story for Rose called Shadows of Rose and the Mercenaries Additional Orders. So let's cover Shadows of Rose first. Shadows of Rose is a lot like the base game. There's puzzle solving, combat, crafting, documents, and boss fights, but it does have some differences. First off, the game has a third-person perspective where the camera follows you much like the remakes. But Rose isn't your typical Resident Evil protagonist, because she has powers that can be used on the Sclerotia flowers to clear paths, slow down enemies, and counter enemy attacks. However, slowing down and countering enemies requires a sprig of White Sage to be recharged. The levels are mostly reused from the base game, but there are some new enemies, like the dolls, the mannequins, the face eaters, and the executioner. One problem I have with the perspective is that things can get in the way when you're trying to line up a shot. There are more things I could talk about, but let's talk about the story here. Rose meets with a guy named Kay in a park to talk about how she's doing at school. We learn that she's been bullied by mean girls at school, and she keeps her distance from everybody there because of her powers. Kay asks what she'd do if there was a way to get rid of her powers, and she says she'd get rid of them in a heartbeat. They go to a lab where Kay explains that they found some of Miranda's research, and there's a purifying crystal that can remove the mutamycete from its host. But Miranda's notes are incomplete, so Rose needs to make contact with a fragment of the mutamycete so she can enter its consciousness and figure out how the crystal works. She successfully enters the mutamycete, and she comes across a version of herself who helps her get out of the dungeon. She runs into a face eater and accidentally uses her power on it. So you have to book it out of here, but Rose runs into a dead end that disappears by some unseen force. 
This unseen force talks to Rose when she's safe. It tells her that trying to get this crystal is too dangerous, but she doesn't really care. Rose asks if this unseen force is her guardian angel, and it answers sure, and if it has a name, and it answers Michael. For the sake of convenience, I will refer to Michael as he. Rose overhears someone laughing in another room, and we see the Duke in a mask, messing with a Rose double, and we see that he has the crystal. Rose falls into the room, and the Duke sends face eaters after her. Michael believes Rose needs a weapon, and he gives her a gun to defend herself. The crystal is inaccessible, so you need to find three masks to put on the statue. But these masks are surrounded by liquid void, so Rose needs an amplifier to be able to get rid of the sclerotia flowers. The death statue puzzle was incredibly clever. There are four statues that depict different deaths, and you need to push them in the correct order by reading the story. This is a great example of how clever Resident Evil puzzles can be. Rose gets all the masks and opens the lantern, but the Duke reveals that this isn't the real crystal, and he transports Rose into an arena where you have to fight the executioner by shooting him in the glowing weak spot while avoiding the mace. After every weak spot, the Duke will send out face eaters that you need to fight off as well. Do that two more times and the executioner is no more. The Duke says Rose's demise is inevitable, and summons more face eaters, and Michael tells Rose to jump off the ledge, and she finds herself deeper in the stratum, a layer of memories that are far more disturbing. Rose sees the crystal on the table, but the lights go out, and the crystal is gone, along with Rose's guns. You need to find scissors and cut open the plushie, which will give you the relief of the child, and now you have to find dolls and put them in the appropriate spots, which are representations of what the bullies did to Rose. And if some of this is to be believed, then I wouldn't mind it if William took a couple more victims, because these little shits would have deserved it. Road breach, that is very harsh. Are you sure you mean it? If some kids actually tried to burn Rose alive, then infinity times yes I mean it. You now have to retrieve the fuse to the elevator, but the mannequins will get you if you take your eyes off them for too long. And to make it harder, the trip back will add more mannequins to deal with. Good luck! When you get the elevator working, Evelyn comes onto the PA system and tells Rose that she'll tell her where the crystal is if she gets past the dolls, which you're now shrunken down for. This is a stealth section. Just stay out of the dolls' line of sight, and you're good. Well, that and using Rose's disintegration powers, of course. The final part of this section has you booking it away from the mannequin while using Rose's powers, with the dolls making fun of Rose, with one of them bringing up her dad. Rose manages to get away from the mannequin, and she wonders why they brought up her dad when she doesn't even know him. Michael decides to take Rose to her old house, where Rose is able to see Ethan's memories. This part is extremely wholesome. All Ethan wanted to do was be there for Rose, and it brings a tear to my eye watching this footage while writing this. And speaking of writing, Ethan wrote a letter to Rose on her half-birthday, where he promised to do so many things with her, but couldn't do them because he died protecting her. It's sad to see that Ethan wasn't able to do all those things with Rose, despite how much he loved her. But we're not able to be sad for too long because Evelyn comes along and drags her back to to Donna's house. Evelyn tells her that the crystal isn't here and tries to drown Rose. So many friends that it's never enough! It seems you have Cartoon Network's idea of friendship being an abusive shit stain to your supposed friend. Evelyn grabs Rose, but Michael intervenes, but he tells Rose that they can't get out, so you need to fight Evelyn. Evelyn will create shockwaves that you need to take cover behind furniture to avoid. After she's done with the shockwaves, she'll be tired, which is when you can use Rose's powers on her. Evelyn sulks because she was defeated by Rose, and Evelyn lets out one last attack to try and kill Rose, but Ethan pushes her out of the way and tells her to not give up and find the crystal. Rose wakes up, and she wonders if Michael was actually Ethan, but even if she doesn't have the answer yet, she knows she has to keep going. Rose gets to the village, where she makes it to Miranda's lab, where it's spelled out how the Mega My Seat works. When a person dies, their consciousness is stored and preserved in the Mega My Seat, but it will become diffused and diluted over time and mixed with other memories. But people that were attuned to the Muta My Seat retain their faculties in the Mega My Seat. And even if Miranda died, she's able to affect the thoughts and memories of others. And Miranda was unable to create a vessel for her child that died of the Spanish flu, which is why she needed Rose. Rose finds the crystal, which ends up getting rid of her powers. But Miranda shows up laughing and telling Rose that she waited so long for her. Rose asks who she is, and she tells Rose her name and begins telling her how she brought her here. Miranda lured Rose to this realm to get her to willingly relinquish her powers by making an illusion of the real Kay. And now that she's stripped of her power, Rose can be the vessel for Miranda's child. Ethan comes in and tells Rose to run, and they get out of the cave. And it turns out that Michael was Ethan all along. Rose asks Ethan why he let her call him Michael, and he says it's because he didn't want to complicate things. 
Ethan tells Rose to escape while she can, but Rose decides to smash the crystal and get her powers back, and we have a boss fight with Miranda. This fight gives you the ability to dodge by hitting circle and moving the left stick left or right, which comes in handy when Miranda tries to attack. You can also absorb incoming projectiles. This builds up the white sage meter, and once it's full, you can unleash a Mega Mycea attack by holding up on the left stick and hitting circle. Once you land an attack, light her up like it's the 4th of July. Towards the end of the fight, Ethan gives Rose a boost to take Miranda down. Rose finishes Miranda off by disintegrating her, and she withers away. Rose goes to check on Ethan, and he says that even if he wasn't there with her, he always watched over her. And even though Ethan can't come back with Rose, she's still happy that she got to talk with him. They tell each other, I love you, and Rose returns to the real world with Ethan's wedding ring, somehow, and it cuts back to the ending cutscene of the base game. The Shadows of Rose DLC is flawed mechanically in some ways, but I can't deny that the story is really damn good. But we're still not done because we have Mercenaries Additional Orders. <sighs> what is wrong? I just covered, what, 11 hours of content in one sitting? Castle, I think you might need to take the wheel. I have a better option. What do you have, Prime Energy? Even better, Overdrive Mode. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. ENGAGE OVERDRIVE! Alright, let's do this. Mercenaries Additional Orders is an arcade mode where you kill enemies for points, and move to the next area. There's a set number of enemies you can kill to bolster your score, and you need to look for them to meet the quota. But you don't have to kill all the enemies, because you can progress to the next area without killing everything. Between each area, you can buy and upgrade weapons with money you get from killing enemies, but you can't buy ammo because you need to scavenge it from the levels. There are also time bonuses and ability spheres that give you perks like faster movement speed, making enemies explode upon defeat, higher damage at certain ranges, Ranges, and so on and so forth. This mode uses locations from the base game story, and you unlock new ones by getting A rank. You can pick between Ethan or Chris before the start of the level, and they do play differently from each other. Ethan gets access to most of the weapons available in the story, and he still has his knife animation with Angie. Chris just has his set in stone loadout he had in the story, along with two different punches, and the onslaught bar. The Onslaught bar fills up when you use certain attacks after obtaining perks from the Duke. And once you activate it, your movement speed, reload speed, and fire rate increases. This is a lot of fun to play with. One problem I have with this mode is that some stages do not mesh with the style of gameplay, like the Factory. The Factory is too claustrophobic for this mode, and it makes avoiding enemies not fun, especially if you're playing as Ethan. The Mad Village is where things start getting weird, because you have to start killing animals to meet the quota, and some enemies have their size shifted. Beating all the stages with A rank unlocks Heisenberg. He has a scrap projectile with infinite ammo, but you need to hold the trigger to shoot multiple projectiles. And this attack can also be upgraded to shoot more projectiles per volley and deal more damage. Like the scrap shot, there's also the saw blade that takes longer to charge, but it deals great damage. He also has his hammer that you tap R1 to swing for a light attack, and you can hold it down to charge up a heavy attack. And the hammer can be upgraded to send out electricity. Heisenberg can also summon a jet soldat that will attack enemies for you, and this has a cooldown. He also has flash grenades that I never use. Because this mode is about killing things, what am I supposed to do with non-lethal grenades? Beating the Bloody River with S rank unlocks Lady D, who has flies as her projectile weapon, her long nails as her melee, she has a thrill meter that acts like the onslaught bar, and the funniest damn attack in her arsenal, she can throw vanities. Yes, they took that one scene from the campaign and made an attack out of it. The only drawback to playing as Alcina is the fact that you have to duck underneath door frames. Both unlockable characters are fun to play as, but they kind of feel restrictive with their gameplay styles, compared to Ethan and Chris. Mercenaries Additional Orders is an okay side mode, but I really feel like they should have made new levels instead of repurposing locales from the base game. And before we get into my final thoughts, I'm going to power down first. Overall, this game is really good. Resident Evil Village has fun combat and clever puzzles, and it's not really scary for the most part, but I can't deny that the story is excellent. Thanks for watching, and gotta zoom.